to, you know, the, the individual ones. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. We're talking and talking and talking. Welcome back Hi. to uh, Architects of Change Alive. And I'm sitting with one right here, Kelly Corrigan. And this is her new book. Tell me more stories about the 12 hardest things I'm learning to say. And she is a New York Times bestselling author, a great voice, someone really is uh, who's using their voice to move humanity forward. So I'm so glad Hi, you're here. I'm we so were just yicky yacking away yeah. about everything. But she's very easy to talk to. If you think she's very easy to talk to, she is. Very easy. Thank you. Thank you. So I said to you, I'm going to start with asking you how you're trying to move humanity forward, because that's what we say these change makers sure, sure, that we sure. interview are, what they're doing. So yeah. what do you think you're doing with your book? How are you moving it forward? So I. I sort of believe that there's this super strong relationship between productivity and happiness. Okay. And I think that productivity plummets in the face of unhappiness or grief. And I think that happy, it was always my instinct, and it's since I've discovered that it's been confirmed by 50 years of social science, that yeah. happiness is really derived primarily across time and culture by one thing, which is meaningful connection to others. So if meaningful connection to others is the key to happiness, and happiness is the key to productivity and contribution and purpose, which I believe all that. I believe that whole string of events. You have science to back you up. I do. I right. thank God. Um, then, because maybe because I'm a writer, maybe for other reasons, I believe that I want to understand how connection happens. And I believe it happens like live in person uh, in conversation. Yeah. And so then it was like, what are the words? This is what came up over the dinner table one night. Like, what are the words that adult life requires? Like, what must we be able to say? So we got talking about someone we, we know in our family who cannot say, I'm sorry. Right. And it was like, well, that's just such a game ender. Like, yeah. if you, you have to be able to do it because you're definitely going to screw up repeatedly in small ways and large. And then that gave birth to this larger conversation about, like, what's the difference between saying I'm sorry, which is tends to be overused and sometimes mm -hmm. comes Amen. out in a really snarky way, like, I'm sorry. Yeah. If you have teenage girls. Or you don't girls. even mean it. Right, exactly. Yeah, right. Yes, or you're over-apologizing, like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, yeah. can I just ask you? Um, then we started talking about I was wrong mm -hmm. and what humility that requires and what a really massive statement that is. And that got me wheels really turning about, like, okay, so if I was wrong, it's one of the sentences that you have to be able to say to be a successful adult and to be in loving, connected relationships, mm -hmm. which is the source of all happiness, which is the source of productivity, then what are the other sentences? So your, your goal really with this book, and it's really funny. I, I was telling Kat, I was sitting in my bed last night, alone, laughing out loud, actually, at the book. That's like my favorite image of any reader. Yeah. It's just someone in bed kind of giggling. <laughs> with, and then I was like this, yeah. with the pen, yeah. with the glasses, which I'll spare you. Ha <laughs> ha. Yeah, it's great. That's yeah. so great. So, um, but, so is it your hope that by reading this book, by sharing this book amongst other adults, that you will, by giving them these phrases, promote connection and promote happiness and promote belonging. And productivity. And productivity. I think, I think that, um, I think that it's a really noisy, chaotic world. Yeah. And Amen. for me, uh, I felt like I needed some go-tos. So if, if it's a noisy, chaotic world, and we're all kind of stuck in our, like, quotidian can we curse on Architects of Change? Yes, you can if you are if you need to. I feel I need to. Okay. There's a lot of quotidian bullshit. You don't have to say, oh, yeah. <laughs> I was wrong. You can't say that. <laughs> God. Um, this is where are the censors? Uh, but, you know, we all get kind of like sucked into the, what is right in front of us, what yeah. is urgent but totally unimportant. And then... That's so important what you just said. Yeah. What is urgent but totally unimportant. Right. Which is like 90% of every day, right? Amen. And I think that's where a lot of dissatisfaction comes from, actually. Like, I have had periods in my life where I felt, um, quote, unquote, productive. Like, I had a list of things to do, and I did them. Mm -hmm. But nothing about it felt particularly substantial or significant or meaningful or like it was contributing to anything that really mattered. Like, so I think you, they're kind of the death by a thousand cuts life is doing 25 five-minute tasks every single day and never like falling into that awesome state of flow where you think this, what I'm doing right now really matters. It's a lot like, you could compare it to children and m mothering, which is to say that when I'm doing a thousand tiny things with mm -hmm. my family, it has no, there's no potential for satisfaction there. It's just like boop, 
boop, knock it off the list, knock it off the list. I got her to lacrosse practice. Okay, now we got that form handed in. Okay, she's going to do her homework now. Yeah. She cleaned up her room, whatever. That's not like what I'm in it for. That's not what I became a mother for. But then once a month, maybe, of teenage girls, mm -hmm. someone will come to me and they'll, they'll bring me like a big, juicy, thorny problem. And we will sit together in these two particular chairs that draw in our family off our kitchen and we'll sit there for maybe 45 minutes. And that is when I feel truly useful and truly connected. But that's really the exception, not the rule. So the idea of Tell Me More and just sharing all these stories from my, you know, peculiar and um, oftentimes totally unsuccessful life is that maybe if we had these go-to sentences, we could find that connection more easily in the context of the quotidian so to go through for people who probably are, this is resonating with them, so many people kind of going through life, getting stuff done, and then at the end of the day go like, what did I do, right? It just it didn't feel very good. Right, and, and people I think are all searching for this kind of connection, this yeah. kind of conversation. And people often, especially I, I have four kids, and they'll also like, I don't even know how to get going in a conversation, I know, I know, right? I know. Yeah. Tell me more, I was telling Kelly, somebody suggested to me to use that in my parenting, and it's really been, um, incredibly successful. I actually use it with my brothers uh -huh. who don't emote much and then I'll try to say like tell me more and then more will come out if right. I shut up. Right, right, right. Uh, what are the other you think 12 go-to's that people can like write down and bring with them yeah. out or bring in? Right. So well I have to pause on tell me more because it's my favorite and that's why I got the title. Um, but tell me, you use it with your girls in here. I do, and yeah. and you know, I think if you're um, a proactive, caring mother, mm -hmm. that that could easily translate into being a fixer. And that's not really ideal, actually. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, that's not actually what's going to work. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is that oftentimes the presenting issue is not really the heart of the matter. But you're never going to get there if you jump in and respond to the presenting issue. So she says, I didn't get invited to a party. Or no, she'd say like, Claire, Claire took my t-shirt. And it's like, you don't care about Claire taking your t-shirt. There's something else going on. So you call that the thing behind the thing behind, behind the, the thing. Behind the thing, exactly. So then you, if you just sit back and you let them do like some emotional spring cleaning and like, you know, go behind the thing. You know, I'm, I can always picture like a garage, like cleaning out a garage, that it's like first you pull this thing out, then you pull this thing out, then this thing all the way, the thing against the wall is like now when you look at your garage, it's like oh, I finally got all the way to the back wall. And it's like that conversationally. I mm -hmm. feel like people are um, dealing with the superficial thing, the very first thing that their hands touch or that their conversation lands on. And the truth is that it's meaningless. And that's why so many interactions are so much less than they could be. Because everyone's in a rush, and that we have this fixer energy. Mm -hmm. And to me, fixer energy and love are like super connected. Like I, it's hard, it was hard for me to grok the idea that you could love your kids as passionately as every parent does, and not try to come up with solutions for them. That yeah. seemed like ludicrous to me. That seemed like leaving them hanging. But that's not, I don't think that's the case at all, especially as they get older and they're teenagers. I think it's not satisfying at all for them to have you solve their problem. Right. It's sort of insulting and condescending. It's, it's like, I'm not being with you. I'm not feeling your feelings. I'm just saying, oh, just do this. So which of these, uh, I know Tell Me More is your favorite, but yeah. which is the one that's given you the biggest aha in conversations of these? I think I don't know is a really big deal. I think that there's a super high premium on conviction Mm -hmm. and people who are sure of things. And I think that's oversimplifying. Like 99% of the time, if you're dead sure how to solve a problem, you've probably oversimplified it. Or like why something happened. So I have this big hang up about narrative. Mm -hmm. So you gotta stick with me on this because okay. it's kind of like a weird okay. concept. But I think that because of the way we're taught in school, like mm -hmm. about this five part dramatic structure, mm -hmm that go, it goes to a crisis point and then it resolves and like people learn lessons and there's a moral to the story. So we learn that and then we're in the world and we're like consuming fiction and we're watching movies and all the awesome TV that's out there and we're almost like programmed at, a, at every level to expect this arc mm -hmm. that resolves at the end, that like denouement is like a real thing, like things get tied up. And then I think because we're so steeped in it, 
this mm -hmm. structure, that when we're talking to each other, we do it without even realizing it. So like someone, my husband will tell me something about a deal that fell apart and I'll be like, well, I can tell you. I mean, the minute Tim got involved, like there's no chance. So that's me saying like, I know why this happened and I have a little story to tell about it and I have a resolution for you. And people really want that. Like I think that's how our brains are structured. I think like the machine wants to put things in little boxes and say this is how it happened and why it happened and this is when I can, and once I know that then I can move along. Mm -hmm. But I think that's a super big disservice because I think rarely does life resolve like that. Mm -hmm. And I think most relationships kind of go in circles and I don't think very much gets sorted out. And I think many people don't learn their lessons, including myself. Mm -hmm. And that it's a much more incremental game than I thought when I was 20 or 30, when I was in my kind of oversimplifying zone. Right. Like now I'm 50 and I think this is incremental. Like if my marriage gets like 2% better this year, big year for like Kelly and Edward, you know, like it's not gonna, there's so much less movement than I was expecting. And I know so much less than I thought I did. Like, I don't know why I got cancer in my 30s. And everybody, when I had it, and I was walking around Bob with these two kids in diapers, everybody was saying to me, was it in your family? Was it in your family? Yeah. Or what a wake up call. Which to me was like trying to make a little narrative about it. It was like, it was in her genes, so she got it. And that's how that story goes. And it's like, well, it wasn't in my genes. I'm so sorry to tell you that horrible thing. And who wants to face that headline that like any one of us can yeah, get any right. problem at any moment. And then the other thing is like that when people would say, what a wake up call. I, like I worked for United Way for 10 years. Like I didn't need a wake up call. Yeah. Like I knew I had it good. I knew my sheets were soft. I knew central heating was a big deal and a hot shower every day was like a total luxury. So. But they wanted that because they wanted there to be a reason right, why right. this happened to this poor 36-year-old. They wanted it to make sense. They wanted it to make sense. They wanted right. a moral to the story. Like that would be the perfect ending is like she was out of, she didn't have appreciation for her life. She got very sick and right. then they really appreciated their life. But that's in a way you, you talk in here about loss, right? Mm -hmm. You talk in here not as a wake-up call but as a, like a perspective shifter, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know? So... Uh, and it it kind of changing your perspective and not being a wake up call, but make, giving you some urgency to your life, giving you yeah. some different take on life. Yes, so I'm talk just about that because so I'm also a big believer in loss, really kind of the fragileness of life, right? Yeah. And how it could happen, whatever it is, could happen to any of us at any I know. given time. I know. So this is what we've got. So what yeah. did it, you you write about the loss of a great friend? Yeah. And your father. Yeah. So I. Gave, in, in a short period of time, I gave two eulogies. So I eulogized my dad, which was fantastic, and he was an old man and he got a great life. Mm -hmm. And then I eulogized my friend Liz, who's 46 and had three kids. And you know, you stand on an altar looking at a, an eight year old, a 10 year old, and a 12 year old talking about their mom, and it I would think that that would change you forever. Mm -hmm. That, like, never again right. would you flip out over, like, say, um, cut toenails on your kitchen table, which I came down to one day. Revolting, I know. And, but I did. I flipped out over the cut toenails. And that's really what I was bringing to the question that's underneath this thing. It's like, how are we to live with the fact that we, at, on some days we're so poignantly aware of our mortality and the mortality of those that we love. Right. And we're, we can see the frame. Like this, the, the whole experience we're having here is framed by the idea that at any moment we might not have it. Versus like seeing what's dead center in front of us. Like it's like a bifocal thing, you know? Like I remember this guy, these are bifocals, and the, I just got them. And this, this guy was talking to me, and I was in kind of like a dreamy state, and I was hearing it all as like a metaphor. And he's like, So here's the thing. There's a lot of stuff you want to see far away. You want to see the leaves on the trees, whatever. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of stuff you need to see close up. You know, when you're clipping your fingernails, you need to be able to see them. And I was like, uh-huh, uh-huh. And I'm kind of hearing this as like, is this a euphemism for life? Yeah. Like, you know, you got to see nature and see the yeah. wonder in the world, but also you got to get your shit done. Oh, I did it again. Yeah. Um, sorry. She was wrong to do that. I was, I was wrong. She was wrong. That's one of the sentences. Yes. Um, but tell me more. Ah! <laughs> we can do a whole conversation <laughs> just I don't know, Maria. <laughs> what are you really saying? What is the thing behind the thing behind the bifocals? Oh, my God. What are you really want to say? But, but it was like, that. that is... That is the case, that we're right. at one moment needing to look at things very close in front of us and also keep some sense of the larger context. And that we have to live our day 
inside of the frame that is that Liz isn't here. But but how did that change your life? How did that change your perspective to eulogize not just your father, um, which you said was fantastic, but and I actually eulogized my dad and didn't find it fantastic. You didn't? No. I, I, I mean, no. I eulogized my mother. I found it moving, and but I found the whole thing really upsetting. Yeah. And um, oh, I cried but, straight through it. Oh, okay. But just the energy in right, the room was like so loving. Right, but it's completely different than a 46-year-old friend, yeah. right? Yeah. So how did that shift your mind, shift your life, shift how you see up close and far away? I don't know because it changes so frequently. Like I, the the thing that I want to admit is that I can't like hold the posture. I can't hold the perspective. I can only visit it. So, and that's what I'm admitting in this whole book is that I actually need these phrases and I need these go-to ideas to bring me back to that place of perspective because without yeah. them, I'm sliding into the trivial and okay. the urgent but unimportant way too easily, more easily than I would have ever thought. Like you're standing there looking at these kids who you love so much and this husband who you just adore and you're thinking, I will never again bitch and moan about like an yeah. extra five pounds or my kid wearing my sweater and losing it or a parking ticket. But then you do. Yeah, yeah. And so the first s phrase in the book is a really weird one, and it's the only one that I think people will not have heard before, which is, it's like this. So my husband worked at a startup in San Francisco. It's called Medium. And it's like everything that startups are, like kombucha bars and meatless yeah. Mondays and nap pods and the whole deal. And one of the things that they had was this meditation teacher, this guy Will Kabat-Zinn. Mm -hmm who's brilliant, you should have him uh, come on this. And okay, will you invite him for me? Yeah, sure, sure, okay. we'll do a thing together. Great, done. Um, and he's John Kabat-Zinn's son, who's that. like a thing. Yeah, I know. yeah, he's a thing. He's a thing, yeah. yeah. you're a thing. Yeah. <laughs> everybody actually is a thing. Yeah, I know, they don't know it. They don't know it, um, yeah, everybody is a thing. I and like that's that. the purpose of this show, actually. The purpose of this is to try to inspire everybody to see themselves as as a Not force. a thing, as a force, really, yeah. as someone who really can incrementally, as yes, you said, yeah. change the world, which is, she was saying, how the world actually gets changed incrementally. Yeah, and these tiny, tiny steps. Yeah. So anyway, it is what you were saying, the, the phrase that you think nobody's heard. Yes, it's like it's this. It's like this. Yeah. So I was telling Will this problem, which is that I was just so feeling so ashamed of myself that in light of what had happened, in light of Liz dying, that I was still like flipping out over this trivial nonsense. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, Kelly, it's like this. So if, you know, there's a little passage that I would just read if you want. Yeah, um, go ahead. That really puts a nail on it, which is... Um, what page? Uh, 25. 25. Um, this is a really good book, so if you are sitting in bed at night, uh, like I do, uh, this is a really good book to p pick up, read, and then I, I put it on my bed and woke up to it. Oh. I slept with it last night on my bed. So it's we're just sleeping really, together. You we're mean. sleeping together. <laughs> Lord, Big I'm announcement. glad I'm sleeping with someone. Facebook Live. <laughs> <laughs> ah, God, that's right now. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, page 25. Um, Liz. Get the book. Tell me more. Okay. Go. Liz would have done a week of aggressive bromo domain inhibitors at Cedar sinai for one morning of hairballs, eggshells, and toenail clippings. To see her kids become teenagers screaming obscenities at each other in the hall, she'd have given up every organ in her pelvic cavity. Then there's Greenie, who would have told you that life was a carnival. Greenie's my dad. All music and snack stalls, fortune tellers and strong men. It's magical, lovey. Edward, my husband, called Greenie a happiness genius, but mm -hmm. ask anyone. He was as excited about being alive as anyone you will ever meet. This isn't just a kid making a hero out of her dad. And me? I walked next to him in that festival light for almost 50 years, and then one night in February, his hand went still in mine, and here I am, same as ever, except quicker to anger and 13 pounds heavier. Shouldn't loss change a person, for the better, forever. Maybe Will's curious phrase, it's like this, applies here too. This forgetting, this slide into smallness, this irritability and shame, this disorienting grief, it's like this. Minds don't rest. They reel and wander and fixate and roll back and reconsider because it's like this, having a mind. Yeah. Hearts don't idle. 
they swell and constrict and break and forgive and behold because it's like this having a heart lives don't last they thrill and confound and circle and overflow and disappear because it's like this having a life that's so beautiful Kelly. that's really beautiful thanks and it's and it's so true and in the book uh, you write I was saying in the beginning you write about what it's like it's like this that you one minute you want to run for Senate the next minute you have no idea what your purpose even is yeah one minute you're all gung-ho and you want you're at the Women's March and then you come back and you have no interest and yeah. that that we're all kind of like this in yes. a way yes and that what makes us also understand how we're alike yes. are all these kind of they're almost like not buoys yes in a way. but they Bees. are yes yeah which is what I was thinking of is that we all need as particular as you, you talk about adult conversations as you go forward in the unknown and the world is so chaotic and changing yeah. you use these seems to me kind of like things you can go back to lifelines yeah that give you uh, exactly. parameters exactly. and structure exactly and do you use them all the time I try to you do I yeah. try to um, yeah I mean, I, like one of them is no, yeah, which is um, insanely, difficult. insanely difficult to right. do. I mean, my, you my said you mother liked that your mother risked being unpopular. She, she was did. okay with being unpopular, and I think that's a really even talk with about us. That. Yeah. So you know, like that's in our right. town, for sure, people I'm sure thought like, oh, that Mary Corrigan, she wanted to buy those kids a pair of jeans. You know, like I begged and fought for guest jeans for like three years, and. Um, and I was the person who wasn't allowed to go to the party when the parents weren't home, and I didn't have an allowance, and I wasn't allowed a blow dryer because, like, school's not a beauty pageant. School's there; you're there wow, to that's learn. Strict. I know. Thank you. No blow dryer. I mean, what would we do with this stuff? Wow. Uh, so yeah, so I, you know, she was building character each and every day, and um, with no, with no, and and I would think that like having been raised by like basically the Rosa Parks of no, that I would be a total ass kicker. And I am not. Like, I, I am really sensitive to my kids being mad at me. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's good. I mean, I, I do not promote this concept. I'm, I'm confessing it. That when, they, when we get into an argument and they storm off, I'm down in the kitchen and Edward is saying, just let him stay up there. It's okay for them to be mad at you. And like I'm like tingling yeah. with like I must resolve this. I can't stand it in another minute. And before I know it, like my body is carrying me up the stairs, and I'm standing outside their door saying, "Hey, I'm sorry. You all right? Is this good? Are we good?" And like trying hard to just mend, mend, mend. Whereas my mom could just let it. I would go bananas. I would not get what I wanted. I would scream horrible things. I hate you. I wish Allison's mom was my mom. You know, like crazy. Ooh. Hard, hard things to hear. And then she, off I would go, and then I'd just see her the next morning. And when I look back on that, I think, like, God, you really could hold the line, you know? Yeah. And, and I think that probably if you are doing it right, especially with teenagers, mm -hmm. there are times when your children are not going to like you. And that has to be... So to, it's her, like to her, it's like this. It's like this. Yeah. It, it, to her, it was like, this is a job to be done. Mm -hmm. I have brought you into this world, and it is my job to like send you off at 18 years old with some sense of values, potential, and possibility. Let me ask you, because not only is this book um, just out, but you also work for you're the creative officer of the yeah. uh, Nantucket Project. Yeah. And it has a similar uh, mission that yes. architects have changed. So talk a little bit about that. You, you're trying to get people to convene in homes yes. to watch conversations like this and yes. the ones that you're doing with the hope of that they'll begin these conversations, yeah. that they'll build connection to what yeah. end? So the gist is that we have for seven years been hosting this Ideas Festival, Four Day Ideas Festival. We've never bring been invited. I have never but been invited. But guess who has been invited? To Nantucket. And she invited my brother. Mark and Shriver. I saw on social media Hi, Mark that she said, I want to see who is my favorite Shriver. And I, w I said, <laughs> wow, this interview is like it's a competitive thing. Okay. And the Shrivers are competitive. I'm yeah. my A game. Put on a dress for you. Yeah, you look good. You book. look really good. <laughs> Read it. Yeah, thank you. Oh, Most yeah. people don't read it. There's okay. a little secret you're not going to know anymore. So anywhere. the Nantucket Project. W what is so your the hope gist with is that? that they've been doing this ideas festival, which you are certainly invited to next yeah, year. Yeah. September 13th through the 16th. Okay. I will personally make sure you get there. Um, 
And they've been creating all these interesting conversations in that event, mm -hmm. but that's not helping enough people. I mean, it's only 700 people go to that. Right. So the idea is that if we can take some of the most interesting talks and short films that they make and put them into these little packages and put them in living rooms across the country, then you would sit together with 15 people, let's say, and watch this 20-minute thing. Mm -hmm. It might have like a little talk, it might have a little film, it might have some poetry, a cello player, a meditation from Deepak Chopra, who knows? Like right. just a little thing that you all experience together because right. shared experience is so significant. Mm -hmm. And then you would s sit together for one or two hours and talk about, talk like we used to talk, talk like you're on a front porch somewhere, talk like you don't have a phone and you don't have anywhere better to be and that you're not like plugged into anything. And the idea is that if, the idea is that when we do what we are made to do, like mm -hmm. we're a social Connect. animal. Yeah, right. like this is what and we do. And use this as your kind of parameters. If you get stuck in the conversation, yes. you have this book yeah. to go back to with the phrases. Yeah, you know. Yes, and just more. the it's a very empathetic book because it's right. it's not actually a teaching book. It's more of a confessional but that ends up being instructive. Yeah, but it is practical. It is practical, right? Even though it's just a set of stories, like yeah. it's kind of entertaining. And then I but think at the end of it, is. you're like, "Oh, right, that does make sense." Right, but it's something I could give to my kids in yeah. a way to say, "Try if you get stuck tonight." Yeah, just say, "Tell me more." Yeah, or just say, "You know, good boy, enough." I was wrong. Yeah, or good enough. Yeah, let's end with good enough. You yeah. kind of have a thing about a lot of the middle place, your life, you're good enough, we're yeah. all good enough, yeah. and yet we're all struggling to be better than we actually yeah. are. I, I, good, en good enough, I don't know what's up with that, I don't know why that is. It could be our animal nature, like it could be that we it's programmed into us to mm -hmm. strive. Um, but it's the, the good enough starts with going to my friends, Claire's best friend is this girl, Ruby, and I went to her bat mitzvah. Mm -hmm. And she's 13 years old and she's up there and I'm sitting next to my daughters who like, you know, are like watching Bachelorette and on Snapchat. Mm -hmm. And this kid, this 13 year old is like reading from the Torah backwards to forwards, no vowels, yeah. speaking another language, singing in front of a whole congregation of people. Yeah, and the really whole like, first communion thing is so weak compared to it that, is, isn't it? It is, it is, it is. <laughs> Oh, it's just like <laughs> obedient followers. Yes. Like I'm going to tell you, and you repeat after yeah. me. Meanwhile, uh, like Ruby's up there I know. running this event. Yeah. And then we say things back to her. And the whole time, I'm like, what we're saying to her is like, you are good enough as you are. You are ready to be in the world and to be an agent of change and to be a force for good. That's what that whole message is. Mm -hmm. And I have felt that for a long time that we're we've gotten in the last say 150 years to like really coddle our kids like the idea that my Georgia who's 16 and so smart and capable is gonna have to go to school for like six more years before she can contribute to a workplace that just seems crazy to me like mm -hmm. you know how hard could it be to work at some of these places like I don't know. I'm right. not a fan of all this like preparation preparation on top of preparation I'm a, and then release right. I'm a fan of more like integrated like some part of the day we're growing and some part of the day we're contributing instead of like Grow, 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 develop, 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 then contribute. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Um, so anyway, this good enough, that's where it started. But then I, and then I got on the phone with this, um, the mom, Ruby's mom, his name's Ariel, and she's a therapist. And she told me about the training that you go through to become a therapist. And one of the things you have to do is these kind of practicum, which is some number of hours where you are with patients and then you're, you have a mentor who's helping you help them. And her, one of her earliest patients was a victim from Rwanda of rape. Her entire family had been killed, and she came to some tiny town in Texas with her son that, who came from rape. And Arielle's just Arielle. She's just like, she went to Cal, and then she went to UT Austin to get her degree. But she doesn't have any, in her sense, she was like, I am not good enough to have this conversation with her. And then her mentor was saying, what makes you good enough is not what you think makes you good enough. You being good enough is not, I have life experience to match hers. Right. That's not what allows you to be empathetic. Empathetic is not knowing the feeling of another person. It's feeling the feeling of another person, which doesn't require personal experience that is identical to the story they're telling you. What makes you good enough is that you have the capacity to listen. Right. And that's super meaningful. Like being someone's witness, observing someone's pain, mm -hmm. 
is often so like... So with this, because this is super important, I think, yeah. that not having to have the same experience, not having to know yes. what that experience yes. was, the I don't know, yes. but being able to sit as the tell me more yes. unfolds. Like being witnessed. So, that, so a week ago, I was in New York. The book came out on uh, January 9th, and I got a migraine. And I, I, it was awful. Yeah. And so I went to the hospital. I went to the ER at New York Presbyterian. And my boss, Tom Scott, from the Nantucket Project, just got in the car and came to the ER. And he just stayed the whole nine hours that I was in the ER. There was absolutely nothing he could do. And he's never had a migraine. But he saw it. So there's like one person in the world who saw that I was on a stretcher, pushed at the end of a hall, in a New York City ER where I was like the lady with the headache. Like, the New York City ER is no place to go if you don't have, like, a gunshot wound. You know what I mean? Yeah. You're just, like, so far down the list of things they need, should On be the worrying about. the book came out. Yeah. So was, and, but it was so, it was such a great reminder to me of what a big deal wow. it is to be witnessed. Like, I was a nanny for a family who had lost their mom. And I, and I was wow. barely helpful. The, the dad was a flight attendant on Qantas. Yeah. So he'd be gone for three days and then home for four. And during the four days he was home, there was nothing for me to do, and he didn't want me to do anything. But then I realized, like, after several months, like, they need an audience. They need someone here to tell the stories to, to witness their slow but unstoppable survival, and to consume this. Like, they can't be alone in here. That, that's what my job is. So then they took me to their beach house and we went to the beach house and they showed me where they walked and they showed me the dock and they sh told me the stories about how she would jump in first and everyone would wait to go in after her. And like, it was like, oh, I'm just going to hold you. I'm going to be the receptacle for your stories and your memories and I'm going to observe your pain. I'm going to watch you cook this dinner for these kids and get it all wrong and see them get upset that it's not the way my mom used to make the minestrone. And like, we're going to have eye contact on that and that's going to help. That's like actually helping you. So in this book, there's a lot about Liz. And when O Magazine printed an excerpt, and it was, it was really um, a long section. It's my favorite chapter. It's called Onward, yeah. which for sure is like a sentence, a one-word sentence that an adult needs to be able to say, probably more frequently than we ever imagined. I put that in most of my emails. Onward. Onward. Yeah. yeah. And... So anyway, O Magazine loved it. They put it in the issue, and so they wanted to put it in the issue. So I called Andy, the husband, Liz's mm -hmm. husband, and I said, um, <laughs> it was so funny. I said, I, I feel nervous about this. Like, they want to print it, and it's got your kids' names, and they, they're going to put a photo, and it's really intimate. Yeah. And he's like, right, but it's like from the book. Like, we're doing this thing, right? I'm like, yeah, we're doing it, but like probably more people are going to read O Magazine than are going to read this book, and I just want to make sure that you're okay. Like, we're going to go public here, you and me, with this story. Yeah. And he's like, Kelly, I think it's awesome. And then we went to Thanksgiving with them, and I'm sitting with the kids, and Gwenny is the middle one, and she's... Um, you know, she's kind of a mag one of those little magical people, and I don't know what, you know, I'm just, it's, I just, all I want is to be useful to them. Yeah. All I want is this, for this to be great for them, and the idea that it could hurt or upset any of those four people is just, like, unthinkable to me. So it's all throughout this whole process, been very careful, like, to make sure that we're all aware and we're going to see how this is going to play out, and we, I mean, I keep bringing up different scenarios, like, what if she's at school and someone says, blah, 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 my mom yeah. read your book, whatever. So we really worked it through, and and he was unyielding. He was like, Kelly, it's great. Like, we want her in the world. We yeah. want people talking about her. So anyway, we were at Thanksgiving dinner, and the, Andy said, oh, we had a really big day when the O Magazine thing came out. We sat down, we read it together. It was really beautiful, whatever. And I'm looking right at Gwenny, like across the candlelight in this beautiful room in their house, and said, uh, was that okay? And she goes, I thought it was pretty cool. And I was like, well, then I'm out. Forget it. Who cares? Who cares yeah. if it sells five copies? Like, this person that I love yeah. so much and can do so little for is happy that it's in the world. So I'm out. You know? It's beautiful. Beautiful. Uh, we could go on forever, but, uh, and we'll, we'll continue. I'm actually yeah, yeah. In motion. So tell me more. Kelly Corrigan, she's written a lot of other really great things, but this is her most recent, and uh, it's beautiful. It's funny. It's real. You'll find yourself in it. You'll see yourself in it, and that's a good thing. Yeah. And uh, you'll get some um, 
like life-saving phrases. So when you're at that dinner party or you're across from your kid who's on top of you, you'll know that there's something behind the thing behind the thing and you'll get to the thing behind the thing. So tell me more stories about the 12 hardest things I'm learning to say um, and uh, moving humanity forward really by getting us to connect. One of Mother Teresa now, St. Teresa's favorite quotes of mine is that if you know, we're unhappy, and I'm paraphrasing, so don't beat me up here, is that we've forgotten our sense of belonging, uh -huh. right? That uh -huh. if we know that we belong, whether it's to another person, to a community, that's a grounding thing. Yeah. And this is a book that helps you connect. It helps you know that you belong. And uh, when you feel you don't, it gives you something to grab onto to get back in the game. Tell me more. So great. Thanks for having me. Thank you it was for so being great. here. I was better than Mark, right? Way better than Mark. <laughs> <laughs> We're out. I'm out. <laughs> you heard it here first.